So, the, so I'm very, very grateful for the invitation and I would like to thank three people, uh, especially Pierre Jedlowski, the director from the Musica Electronica Nova Festival here, and Slavik Vichurek, who organized the conference, and of course, uh, Monika Pacnecik, who translated my book, The Digital Revolution of Music, which uh, came out last year in Bes Smyana as an ebook. And my task today would be to combine the topic of the festival, identity, with uh, <coughs> the main thesis of my music philosophy, the digital revolution of music. And the question would be, of course, how and why does the digital revolution change the identity of the new music system? And I will start with the traditional notion of new music. New music emerged in the beginning of the 20th century and it was a reaction against classical music and the main characteristic of new music is that it was for the first time in music history atonal music. So we have, for the, we have the um, uh, defining distinction uh, between classical and music and new music, so this distinction defines in a way the identity of new music. But there are other distinctions. Atonality is a very strong feature and it has a lot of implications. So, for instance, it has the implication that there is uh, um, a distinction also implied between new music and popular music because popular music is usually tonal music and new music is defined uh, insofar by the distinction of serious art and entertainment. Generally speaking, this is a consequence of the constitutive negation of the classical music system, which was based on tonality, which has had a melody, a rhythm, and, uh, and developed harmony. Um, a third borderline um, is established between new music and the other arts, like poetry, theatre, visual arts. And this has to do with the guiding idea of new music. It was an idea of absolute music. Music has been understood as pure instrumental music, and that maybe was, uh, it's not self-understanding, it's not evident by itself, uh, because there have been alternatives like program music, but I come back to the question why new music uh, was so much focused and has been established um, on the idea of absolute music. And there is a, a fourth borderline. Um, new music uh, was never a direct representation of reality, so uh, the it was not in the concept of new music uh, that there is something like ready-made music, for instance. There was all, only an immediate relation between music and the world. And the structure of music sometimes symbolized the structure of the universe, but, as I said, there was no direct uh, um, relation. Even music concrete musicalized the recorded sounds. and. Um, everyday sound became a medium of composing of new music, but it was not thought as new music by itself, so the everyday sound. So the original identity of new music uh, we can describe by at least four distinctions, there can be more, but I think that are the major four distinctions, and these distinctions are uh, in a way, borderlines which define the identity of new music in the historical sense. At that time, that means in the beginning of the 20th century, new music was in a similar state like the visual arts or poetry. Later, uh, there was, new music took a very different development. The visual arts developed, for instance, conceptualism or postmodernism, um, but in new music, Conceptualism in postmodernism has been bypassed 
marginalized or only half-hearted realized. So new music could keep its historical identity for, for most of the time in the 20th century. So in this way, there was, in comparison with other arts, we can talk about a postponed history. And you see here in the book a chapter with the title Postponed History. <coughs> and the question is, of course, why new music could exist in this mode of classical modernism so long? Why could it keep its classical modernist identity until recently? And why did this asynchronicity came with the digital revolution to an end? So that is the way I would like to combine the two topics of identity and uh, the digital revolution. Um, in order to analyze the situation or in order to analyze uh, the development and of the uh, new music system, I use the idea of a dispositive like it was developed by Michel Foucault, and in dispositive is in a way a network of power relations between spoken and unspoken elements, and um, you could simplify it and say there are it's a network of um, institutions and discourses, and this network is understood as a network as part of power relations. So. There in, um, then I analyzed in the book first the institutional shift. I asked the question, how did the structure of the institution change because of the digital revolution? And the second question is, that's developed in the second part of the book, is how did the guiding ideas of new music change? That are the two major questions, and I try to summarize the answers uh, here. The first question is, of course, why at all? Uh, um, why is new music institutionalized at all? And you need institutions always if you have the <coughs> right necessary resources to produce and distribute something difficult like uh, and expensive like new music. So in this way, uh, new music has had a strong institutionalized, and that was the same. Inst uh, form of institutionalizing like uh, uh, like in classical music. So you, you need a music academy in order to teach composers and musicians and conductors. You need ensembles in order to perform the music because if music doesn't sound, it doesn't exist. You need publishing houses which print the scores for a performance and you need some kind of a broadcasting system like radio or television or CDs and you need the festival system, so a special venue where new music is performed. And the digital racial evolution um, doesn't abolish the institutions, but the digital revolution creates bypasses. So we have new technology technologies which allow you to to do something what uh, before only exclusively could be done by um, by the institutions so in this way the um, digital revolution changes the structure of the new music system and it changes the a strong institutionalized music system into an only weak institutionalized social system. And the effect of this kind of deinstitutionalization de is a general democratization of this high culture art new music. You have much more composers and much more pieces in the system. Um, and it's not possible anymore to include and to exclude um, composers and pieces and styles and new ideas uh, by uh, giving out resources or not giving out resources. So the pieces come into existence whether uh, the new music um, institutions like it or like it not. So in this way the old 
institutions don't disappear, however, they lose their exclusiveness and in every respect there are technological alternatives available. So for instance, there are, of course, music and publishing houses, but you have also the ability of self-publishing if you don't have a music publishing house. There is public radio, but there's also YouTube, there's a traditional, there are the traditional music journals, but you can write about music also in blogs. There are live ensembles, but if there is no money for the production, a composer can at least produce a recording by a virtual orchestra, or like I call it an e-player, that are recordings which are realized by instrumental sample data banks and the programs. So I come back and show you an example of that later. So the new technology can uh, either substitute or supplement the services of the institution, which uh, previously only the institution could provide only solely. So that is the, the institutional change, the institutional shift. It's mainly an, uh, a process of deinstitutionalization. The next question is, how does this paradigm shift, how is this paradigm shift accompanied by, um, or how is this institutional shift accompanied by a paradigm shift, by a shift and a change of the guiding <coughs> ideas of music, by the ideas of what is music and what is good music? Um, new music follows then, or follows an idea of absolute music. That is, um, music is understood as pure instrumental music, or music is in its core uh, pure instrumental music. That is music without relationship to language, movement, visual images, and feelings. And that is, in a way, a normative, uh, that is a normative um, statement. Um, or, um, um, Eduard Hanslick said about absolute music, it's tonally moving forms. That is the definition of absolute music. Um, and in this way, the idea of absolute music disconnects music from any relationship to the world. So the notion itself blocks all direct references to the so-called extra-musical material and to the extra musical event. Uh, but by the way, this is not the whole story. They're about absolute music because there is a blind spot in the theory, like some musicologists all already admitted. And this hidden spot is that there is at least um, one connection between music and world, world, but we don't see it because it's very abstract. <laughs> and you could call this abstract relation a metaphysical leftover, and, and you can think about it that the structure of music represents, under the idea of absolute music, the structure of the world. And this situation is now fundamentally changing in, with the digital revolution. There is much more cheap technology available uh, which composers can use in order to combine music with text, with images, with concepts, and with videos. And that is, a very, uh, that is another type of music. That's not anymore absolute music. And I call it, in order to have an opposite notion, relational music. The relational music works with extra musical information in a new way. The relation between music and the world, or the, in other words, between music and reality, is not any more abstract, but it is now quite precise. One can use specific references of the extra musical material in order to create a specific experience of the world. Music philosophy and art philosophy usually ask two questions, main question. So the first question is, 
what is music? And the second question is, what is good music? And usually these two questions are, uh, uh, are separated, but in reality they are interwined. So if you want um, to describe the paradigm shift, uh, you have to discuss um, the uh, two different answers on two different questions. So the first question is, of course, why absolute music was such an attractive idea in the beginning of the 20th century. In the 19th century, there was already a controversy about absolute music and uh, absolute music and program music. And in the 19th century, program music occurred because the, um, the aesthetics of beauty, which was, was the basic of classical music, has been exhausted. So Beethoven's Ninth Symphony was in a way already an endpoint in absolute music, or it was considered as an endpoint of absolute music because he included in the fourth <coughs> movement text. And that was a turning point. But um, so they are, uh, and new music, uh, in new music, the story goes a little bit different. A new music rejected the idea of beauty, and instead of that, it started to explore other aesthetic eigenvalues. This idea of aesthetic eigenvalues I develop in, in my next book. It's, uh, it's called Gehaltsaesthetic. It has been published last year, uh, but I will, will not go in detail. So you have, but what is important <coughs> is uh, there is a specific aesthetic of new music, and it's not anymore the aesthetic of beauty, it is the aesthetic of ambivalence, like you can experience with Ligeti's uh, atmospheres, it's an, an the experience of eventness, like in Kreuzspiel from Stockhausen, or it is an experience of ambivalence. And I think Lachenmann's structural sounds are based on an aesthetic experience of ambivalence. So you have this shift. And um, the, the sublime, the events, ambivalence, that is in a way the new aesthetic material of new music. And you can create this new realm of aesthetic experience by compositional techniques, so you invent 12-tone technique or minimalism or complex system or uh, uh, serialism. Uh, you can create this by new sound material like music concrete or you can and when new playing techniques like uh, Lachemann did with uh, music concrete instrumental. So, and absolute music was so attractive for new music be because it could combine it with, with this kind of material research. So, the new music uh, has had a long phase of could experience a long phase of um, material progress in a way. There was always the possibility to explore and to uh, the, the realm of listening. And so the, the whole paradigm of, uh, of new music is in a way a combination of the idea of absolute music and material aesthetic. And that, that paradigm with these two components is changing and by the digital revolution. First, of course, um, it, it caused a kind of deinstitutionalization, like I said, but these, the digital revolution is in a way a technical, technological revolution and it's an external event. And external events cannot change autonomous art systems in a way. They cannot change the idea. Of course, the computer makes it easier to compose another type of music, relational music, as I suggest. But nevertheless, the idea of relational music could be a bad idea or non-productive. So there needs other reasons. Uh, there needs a second ingredient for this paradigm shift. And that second ingredient is an internal problem of the new music system itself, namely the end of the material progress. 
So you could not any longer explore in a really radical way, a unit com could come up with really radical discoveries in a way, like new music did in the first half of the 20th century until the 60s. And so we have an analogous, analogous uh, situation like in classical music where the uh, idea of absolute mu music already came to an end because the aesthetics of beauty has been exhausted. And now the same case occurred in new music, but uh, not only in relation to the idea of beauty, but also in relation to the sublimity, to eventness, the ambivalence, to all kind of aesthetic values. And this triggers uh, a paradigm shift. And so here I developed, on this point, I developed the idea of a Gehalt aesthetic term. And the argument goes as follows. So if new music is defined basically by the idea like all arts of newness, and newness has been defined through new material, so the di discovery of new aesthetic experiences by the exploring the aesthetic material then maybe you have to define this kind of newness in a very different way. And my suggestion is that the newness of the piece is not any longer defined by the material, by new material, but by new Gehalt. And Gehalt is a German word for content. We have two words in German, Inhalt and Gehalt. And I use always the word of, of Gehalt because the Gehalt is in German a content which needs an interpretation. So I speak, if I speak about a Gehalt's aesthetic term, that means that it's a term that newness is not any longer defined by new, the discovery of new aesthetic material, but you have first, in a way, an, an idea, a topic, um, a message, whatever you want for a musical piece, and then you use every every possible aesthetic tools in order to realize this idea. That is the idea of a Gehalt's aesthetic term. So, of course, that are the two major factors for the paradigm shift uh, of the, the traditional paradigm of new music, which was a combination of material, absolute music and material aesthetic toward a paradigm which is a combination of relational music and Gehalt's aesthetic. And, of course, that could there are other factors involved, but I think that are the main factors. One factor, for instance, is that the digital revolution is in a way a generational shift too. So the digital na natives grew up with this technology and the previous generation didn't. So I think that accelerates the paradigm shift in a way. So that is now the full, full picture of the change of the new music dispositive. So the digital revolution triggers a process of deinstitutionalization, and that will create the possibility of a paradigm shift from an idea of absolute music toward an idea of relational music, and thus this impl implies a Gehalt's aesthetic term. And now I, um, it's possible to explain this strange postponed history in the new music system. So, new music has been highly institutionalized in order to perform new compositions with acoustic instruments for musicians on a stage. So, on the one hand, the idea of absolute music legitimizes perfectly this form of institutionalization, because it's the idea that music is pure instrumental music. And on the other hand, the institutions have an intrinsic preference for the idea of absolute music, for pure instrumental music, because that's exactly for what they, the resources provide. So, though the strong institutionalization and the idea of absolute music are in a way a perfect fit. And that um, is changing now, or has been changed now. So, now I can come back to my uh, main topic, to the topic of identity. So here you see again uh, the scheme of the identity of 
traditional, the traditional new music's identity, which is defined by four borderlines at least. Um, and the question is, what implications does this change of the new music dispositive and will have for the identity of new music as an art form? Um, one, one thing is rather obvious, under the idea of absolute music there was a strict borderline established between pure instrumental music and the other arts and, the, and relational music crosses this border between new music and the other arts. And uh, I always liked the piece from Carola Bach called Schraubdichtung. This piece was already a uh, relational music in 1989, but this was an exception. It was really an exception. And, but today this type of relational music is much more accepted and appreciate it and I would like to present you uh, a newer piece from her. Uh, it's a piece OIC from On the main stage you can see props, two big balls which hold two players on their knees like you see here on the sketch of the score. And these um, two balls undergo a very interesting metamorphosis. Um, so I prepared a six-part video clip and um, first you see the objects only on the stage, second um, these two balls are used like musical instruments, like drums. The third stage is the two balls become eyes, uh, the fourth the eyes fulfill their perceptual function, they turn into the direction where the sound comes from on the stage. Fifth, the music becomes more complex, the sound comes from everywhere, the eyes don't move, so that is the stage of listening with open eyes, you could say, and the, at the last part, the eyes move in the rhythm of the beat, which is caused by the beating of these balls, like a drum. So here you have a synthesis of the visual sense and the sense of hearing. I think this uh, piece is a great example also of self-reflection, self-reflection of relational music, um, because the stage design looks like a face that observes what is going on on the stage. Okay, so the punctuated line means that the definition or the self-description of new music is breaking apart at this point. So, um, if the notion, the notion of new music is extended into the field of relational music, then the borderline between new music and the other arts 
is suddenly not anymore defined. It is an open question. What is the difference between uh, music and, like, say, theater or visual arts and so on? Another breaking point of new music's identity is the appearance of conceptual music. So we have now digital conceptual music and there's another uh, interesting point in relation to conceptual music because of course there is something like what we would call uh, conceptual music from the 1960s today but it has never um, defined as conceptual music. Even the German word concept music did not exist so I introduced it in uh, my music philosophy, I wrote about concept, concept music, I used the word, and then I started uh, to read about it, or I tried to read about it, and the word was not available, not on Google, not in any publication, uh, it was not introduced, and that means um, conceptual music, what we uh, perceive as conceptual music today, has been perceived as something different in, in the 20th century. Um, Pieces like 433 from Cage, Fluxus pieces by George Brecht, I'm sitting in the room by, by Alvin Lucio, I consider as conceptual music pieces, and but they uh, have been really experienced and uh, understood in a different way, and when I found out that I um, wrote an article, um, as, and this article was then published in the Neue Zeitschrift for Music, uh, it's called um, Conceptual Music as Catalyst for the Gehalt Aesthetic Turn in New Music. And this article is translated into Polish in the New Music Journal, Glissando. And uh, so here I try to explore this uh, strange postponed history of, uh, of conceptual music further. And the argument is that under the prevailing idea of absolute music, Conceptual music has been always interpreted as a kind of minimalism, as an extreme subtle aesthetic experience. Um, and there was no need under this idea for pieces which do not need musicians, or which even destroy instruments like Namjoon Pai. So, um, so this conceptual music in a way was only accepted and understood as such by the help of digital technology because now uh, composers, young composers started to do conceptual music but not for, for festivals but they did it by themselves and put it online and only after there was a discussion about conceptual music this conceptual music pieces has been performed on festival though they did first the work by themselves without a commission um, in fact, in fact, the most provocative aspect of conceptual music is its anesthetic character. You remember Duchamp tried, uh, invented the ready-mades because he want, want, wanted to get rid of all aesthetic art, especially uh, cubist painting. So ready-mades are, by, the, by definition, anesthetic objects. He tried to find objects which don't uh, trigger and a positive or negative experience, aesthetic experience. Um, so, and I would like to show you one example which I like from the Spanish composer Alberto Bernal portrays, and here you see the portrait of Arnold Schoenberg, that's a whole series of portraits.
What is important at the piece is it's really an example that conceptual music is anesthetic. That is not composed in order to cause a special aesthetic experience. It's about an idea which has been realized in the context of new music. So you see first the contours of Schoenberg's face. Um, so you could interpret it it's an abstract, abstract sound image of Schoenberg in the new music world. And then starts, maybe you could say it's our idea of Schoenberg as the founder of new music, and then starts a process which erased this artificial image by conceptual and aesthetic music. And at the end of this destruction, we see the dark photography uh, of Schoenberg. It's, so that is, in a way, uh, you have another look of uh, the founder of new music uh, after uh, this piece. Um, and what is, I think what becomes obvious here, that Schoenberg is a composer of classical modernism and not of avant-garde, because the core of avant-garde is conceptual art or conceptual music. So with conceptual music, the distinction between new music and reality is broad or even dissolved. Um, everything can be transformed into sound and music, even a photography. So it is, of course, a truism that postmodernism crosses the border between elitist and popular art. But in comparison with the visual arts and new music, we can find only a half-hearted postmodernism. Examples of such half-hearted musical postmodernism are, for instance, the first symphony of Alfred Schnittgen, or the third string quartet, Im Innersten by Wolfgang Riem, or the star the piece The Style by Lewis and Reason. And that are all uh, great postmodernist speech pieces which I like, but they do not realize the idea of postmodernism in full extent, at least if you compare what was and what is postmodernism in the visual arts. So these pieces have, which I mentioned, I have already, um, they include tonality again, but they do not really cross the border to popular music, but instead they quote classical music. That is in a way musical postmodernism under the control of an idea of absolute music. And, and music, this kind of musical, half-hearted musical postmodernism is new music, is like it sounds. Um, it's in a way, it sounds like another new music style. If you really want to understand what is postmodernism in music, you could ask yourself the question, uh, who is the Jeff Koons of new music? So, and Jeff Koons uses pornography, kitsch, tribal genres like Western or the detective movies. And that is, of course, not the topic of the most prominent postmodern pieces in, new, in the new music system. And, and the question is why? So and I elaborated this question in this article here, which only uh, two weeks ago has been published. It's called Muzak, or How Finally Postmodernism Troubled New Music. The article has two parts. In the first part, I analyze the, the idea of postmodernism in new music. So that, of course, there are dictionaries and the articles of postmodernist postmodernism in music of the pieces of the 70s, and 70s, 1970s, and so on. But what I discovered is that the musicologists use um, a notion of postmodernism which goes back to Lyotard. So it's a philosophical notion of postmodernism. And Lyotard connects postmodernism to the experience of sublimity. And that is, of course, a contradiction because the postmodernism in the visual arts uh, is everything else but not sublime. So you have Jeff Koons, it's banal and not sublime. That's a contradiction. And then there are, of course, in the visual arts and in architecture and in 
in literature, there are famous articles from Leslie Fiedler and Berto Echo or Charles Jenks about postmodernism, and you see they have a very different idea of, of, of postmodernism in the arts. So I analyzed this and I, I argue that we need uh, really to first, we have to get rid of this idea of postmodernism from Lyotard, and we have to um, focus much more on these theories of postmodernism uh, which have been developed in the arts, in the visual arts. And in the second part, I analyze the piece of Moritz Eckert, Muzak, and because I think this is a really great uh, example for musical postmodernism, and um, the piece is a collage of pop music. So it imitates pieces from Elvis Presley, from Louis Armstrong, Lou Reed, Tom Waits, David. David Bowie, John Lennon, and so on. It's 40 minutes long, and it's performed with a huge symphony orchestra at the Musica Viva last year. And the second important aspect is, it uses, of course, text, because popular user, music uses always text, and usually that are love songs. And then you can make a very strange experience, but you have to know something about Morris Eggert in order to come to this kind of interpretation. Moritz Eckert is an insider-outsider of new music, so uh, he is part of the system, but he is always um, criticizing and provoking uh, new music. There's, for instance, a, a video on YouTube, Darmstadt style, where he really makes good fun about um, Darmstadt. Um, so, and he tries for the last 20 years um, the new music system from this postmodernist attitude. Um, and then, suddenly, if you know that story behind, then you see that this love song develop a second meaning. And double coding is a major aspect for postmodernity. So you, you look at an artwork or you read literature, and it has its popular meaning. It attracts like popular art everybody, but it has under the surface a second meaning, and that second meaning uh, you can only perceive as a spe specialist and insider. And the second meaning here with Muzak you can only perceive as an insider of the new music system. So i play you some uh, example. And now I see you and you can really see me And now I can see you And you can really see me And now I can really see you And you can really see me And now I can see you And you can really see me And now I see you And you can really see me And now I can really see you And you can really see me And now I can see you And you can really See me, and now I see just one more time, baby, 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 just one more time, baby, baby. Just one more time. Hey, all the people all around the city. Saturday night is a coming, and the kids are all right. And the kids are all right. Listen to the music. Saturday night is a coming and the kids are all right. And the kids are all right. Oh, baby, I can't stop loving you. Baby, I can't 
can't stop loving you Will you smile when I tell you So I think you have an impression <laughs> <laughs> And uh, what is important to notice here is that this, uh, the man on the right side, uh, that is more echoed by himself. So he is uh, a composer, a conductor, and a singer. So he performs it by himself, and so it becomes even more obvious that it's a comment on new music, and that it's performed at music, Musica Vivo, that is, in a way, a new music festival in the broadest sense. In, in this respect, so the, the third line between new music and um, and popular music has been dissolved. The last argument for a fourth borderline is the borderline between the constitutive borderline between new music and classical music, uh, because of the digital revolution and some technological developments. But this argument is tricky. And it is complicated. Uh, you could say it, even it's dialectical. There is something like contemporary classical music. That is uh, music which is programmed in uh, in concert halls, which is, uh, uses the uh, some of the discoveries of new music um, that are commissions from contemporary composers, which are performed in music festivals or in concert halls. But these pieces which we can call contemporary classical music, are not really new. Because they cannot provide a really new radical aesthetic experience like I could, like Lachenmann or the pieces from Lachenmann, Ligeti, Stockhausen or Cage could do it when they have been performed for the first time. So um, that is one aspect. And that's why um, a lot of people would say, because contemporary classical music doesn't have this innovative power anymore, it doesn't belong anymore to new music because it's not new in, the, in a real sense. On the other side, I think that the aesthetic sound quality of the acoustic instruments is something worth to keep. And that is a necessary, gives us a necessary link to the classical music systems. Um, so the, this, this, this acoustic instrument, like a violin and a, a, a flute, they have been developed in at least 500 years uh, from instrumental. It's, it's a history of 500 years of instrumental building and listening, careful listening to the instruments and perfectionizing these instruments behind it. And I, that's why I do not think on the other side that it will be possible to now to invent new electronic instruments which will surpass the aesthetic quality of the traditional instruments. That, that will not happen too. So the material progress will not continue because you build now digital instruments. The, our perceptional apparatus is limited and I think that classical music and the traditional new music really have explored with this instrument the, the, the realm of listening and of aesthetic experience. And that's why I think it's worth to keep this connection to the classical music. And here comes a technological innovation into the game, na namely the invention of virtual orchestras that are uh, sample databases of uh, acoustic instruments so that you can record um, a score with, by own, without the help of a real musician. So you play the score by, with instrumental samples. And then there's another possibility involved here, uh, that is that you compose the, with this instrumental samples. <coughs> and that is the source um, and I think that is a really interesting development. I call these pieces e-player pieces in order to make a distinction between only virtual music and really composition with instrumental samples. Only recently has been uh, such an e-player piece performed here in Warsaw. It was sideshows from Stephen Takasuki. It was very impressive and the aesthetic <coughs> quality was very impressive because he didn't use uh, electronic sound but he used this uh, 
sample, the samples. And but the point is that uh, Stakosuki uses handmade samples. In 20 years, maybe he he recorded every little sound uh, by himself and collected uh, these databases, and then now he composes his pieces. And um, only by listening to these pieces, I think this aesthetic quality is something really important and a lot of people uh, will start to use but they can't use it now because it's a private sample collection and there is another um, um, person here uh, it's the composer Thomas Hummel who developed a commercial product it's called Contimbra that is a sample collection with, for extended techniques and composers can use it um, for compositions. And he made such a composition and the, um, the difference between his sample database, and I think the main uh, distinction between his sample uh, virtual orchestra and the, the e-player pieces of Takasuki is that in a way um, you can, you have access to this sample so you can use it. So I play you a piece or some parts of the piece from um, the piece Tina Ida Kovalenka for six instruments and e player orchestra. And this e player, in this e player orchestra, for instance, Thomas Hummel can use 70 hops to have a special effect. So it would be even difficult to have a, to have a piece for two hops in real life. And that shows these that this technology, this e-player technology, has, is, is really a tool of democratization. If you want to use acoustic instruments, you can use it. Um, so, I play you a, a little piece that you have an impression, and this piece is also a piece with text. It involves text, it involves, it's about a story of this Russian women, Zinaida Kavalenka, or maybe Ukrainian, which uh, resisted to leave her village close to Chernobyl after the atomic disaster, uh, the nuclear disaster. So this is the situation today. So we have four main constitutive borderlines of <coughs> new music and these borderlines are perforated or destroyed. The, there doesn't exist any stable self-description of new music or you could say that is exactly the case of an identity crisis. And an indication of such an identity crisis is that in the that composers and musicologists start to question the notion of new music and the name of new music. So there was an article by Michael Rehpein, I hereby resigned from new music, and that would imply to leave the new music system at all because new music is so much um, connected to contemporary classical music and so it's a classical music system that um, he would argue you have more freedom if you want to make to follow postmodernist conceptual or relational music strategies if you leave the system at all and you do uh, what you want 
Uh, only recently there was um, an article, a discussion by Johannes Kreidl and, um, and Hannes Seidel in the Musiktexte with um, the title uh, Music Extend or Dissolve. And this proposals have other implications. So if you argue for an extended notion of music, then um, the, that is not in self-exclusion from new music like Ray Punk proposed, but it is an affirmative inclusion of postmodernism, conceptualism or, and relational music, uh, and maybe even contemporary classical music. But the theoretical problem with such an extension or with such an extended notion of new music is where do you stop? Why does punk not belong to new music? Why should visual arts not perform their composition at Donna Esching and Darmstadt? And you don't have any criteria to answer on that question. And the, others, uh, the other proposal, I think that's a proposal Hannes Seidel sympathizes with, is it's a substitution of the name of new music and uh, suggestion to call uh, everything art. Um, but behind this proposal, I think, is a hidden argument or a hidden assumption, namely that conceptual art without any medium specificity is the most advanced art today. So that is, again, a very narrow notion of new music. And you have always uh, attempts to rename new music. So there are proposals like uh, new music is contemporary music, or contemporary art music, or art music, or simple, uh, you define new music as art. The, I perceive this discussion as a symptom of an identity crisis, um, but there could be the question, of course, why do we discuss these identity issues at all? Can we not leave this, this question open? And I would like to present you a, a little example from uh, a lively and vivid example from a performance from Johannes Kreidler, which he did uh, last month. It's a performance called Ear Job in the Haus der Kultur und der Welt. Um, and the, the idea is that everybody who attends his performance and listens to a music piece will get paid. So there are new music pieces uh, and African music and so on, but there is also one piece, Muzak. And the idea behind it is that the listener will get 10 euros if he listens to Muzak, Muzak and 1 euro if he listens to everything else, like new music. And of course, um, not very, much, not very many people could resist and listen to Musa. <laughs> um, but sometimes such a performance um, has side effects. And I found um, a conversation uh, very eye-opening, which has had Johannes Kreidler with, the, with um, a sound artist. And let's let's listen to this conversation. Yeah. Well, what's the company do? No, I'm producing listening. Producing listening for what? Makes the world better. So I'm also a non-materialist. Uh -huh. And I would not listen to this music only out of mercenary reasons. Yeah. I would listen to it out of enjoyment. Yeah, okay, but here it's no enjoyment, here it's work. Yeah. You, have to, you have to take the so money then, if you it. listen so to it. I, I mean, <laughs> why don't you just take the money? When you refer to a job, that's painful. Yeah. Right, and, and you're, like, and you're saying, do it the easy way. No, not necessarily. Yeah, well, I agree but, with like, you. but you don't have to suffer. <laughs> to make, like, you don't have to make yourself suffer. That's, like, it's yeah. been 500 years of that shit. Like, Protestantism yeah, yeah, yeah. and stuff, too. And like, he uh, thinks I'm stupid because I like yes, music. Yes, but I think that stupid. says more yes. about you than yeah. you. He's a fascist. There's a value for yeah. each. Yes. And this yeah. is what confused me, because if it's work to listen, it seems to me that 
they should each be the same value. No, Otherwise, you're making a judgment on of which course, one. Yes, that's but part why? Of the why make a judgment? Yeah, but we're in, cap in capitalism <laughs> when things are paid. Well, I mean, there's a gender pay gap, for instance. Yeah? So men get better but paid. Then your judgment is that it's the ugliest and the hardest. Yes. So that's your judgment, but it conflicts with my judgment as a sound artist that I can actually find ways of making it really beautiful. Your company is like um, a dictatorship. If your company judges what is good to listen yes, to and yeah, what is bad yeah. to listen to, what is work to listen to, what yeah, is not that's, work. But that's, that's how, how the world is. is. Obviously, if you make judgments about, uh, or you make a distinction, between music and Mozart, you can easily become a fascist. And that is interesting because it is a kind of vulgar postmodernism which is widespread. And I think you need an identity of new music in order to um, defend it, to defend yourself from such kind of ideology and uh, vulgar postmodernism, I und it is always the case, it's in a way, if you take pluralism literally and turn it into an ideology, then I would call it in vulgar postmodernism and, and, and then you can become very easy a fascist. Um, so, and that means that the value of art or music is only in the eye of the beholder. But um, that is devastating. That has devastating consequences for some uh, a little uh, art field like new music because it would mean that you have to give out your resources to, for everybody with an artistic ambition. It would mean that normative judgments um, but if every normative judgment is fascist, then it would end any discourse of culture. So new music without identity is not capable of, capable of survival, I would argue. That's why the discussion about the notion and the name of new music has started once again. It's a controversy about identity. So we would need a notion of new music which on the one hand includes all this strategies which led to the deconstruction of the traditional new music identity. So postmodernist, conceptual, relational strategy or composing for e-players. And on the other hand, it should exclude a simple identification of new music with other arts, with, with reality, or with popular art or classical music. And Here's my proposal. So what is essential for new music today? I think the answer should be that new music is a reflexive culture. Um, and reflexive culture is in a way, and um, the other way, it, it's, it's an, not a synonym, so it's a more adequate name for what we called previously high culture high culture turns into a reflexive culture. The old criteria do not define the borderlines and the identity of new music anymore. Um, and that means music, new music can be tonal and atonal, elitist, popular, aesthetic or anesthetic, absolute or relational. But what um, the criteria is that the uh, new music composer can work with these distinctions, where he can operate with these distinctions. And in so far, new music has a memory for history, it has a historical conscience, because it has to be aware of this uh, overcoming of taboos or of this crossing the border. And the freedom of new music is, in a way, the freedom to use these guiding distinctions in a creative way. The distinction doesn't define anymore the border, but you can use the distinction in order to create pieces. But that means the new music pieces are, in a way, very complex. 
and difficult. And they are not complex in the way of complexism, so it's not only a complexity of the of the music, but it's the complexity of uh, of the relationship between sound and reflection. And that is, I think, the most important aspect. New music is a discursive art, and so I think it's a good idea to include a conference about new music into a new music festival. Thank you very much.